for all these reasons, in media's rest becomes an important uh, narrative technique. And as I said earlier, beginning with Homer, you find even the recent practitioners employing this uh, literary technique for various purposes. Well, if I begin like this, I am sure you would wonder if you have really missed anything uh, that I might have said before or if it is some kind of an editing glitch that instead of beginning because you are used to the greeting right in the very beginning we say hi, how are you, nice to see you, welcome back again to our classes and all that. Now, all of a sudden what has happened here, we began something in the middle, is it an editing glitch or did the teacher forget to introduce you to the topic or did you miss anything, all these questions uh, automatically you know pop in your head, right. Well, uh, this was done for a specific reason and the reason uh, would be evident in the subsequent slides. Well, now forget all that you heard, come back to the beginning. Hi there, welcome to see you all of you in this uh, eighth week and we are in lecture 36. If you can recall, we have been discussing fiction and therefore, I can welcome you again to this ongoing discussion on uh, fiction. In the last class, we were discussing uh, types of fiction. If you can quickly recall, we discussed how fiction, if it can be compared to a tree, the types of fiction can be called its branches and we identified the three branches, you know, three major branches of fiction as literary fiction, genre fiction and mainstream fiction and uh, within all of them we went on discussing sub genres of fiction especially in genre fiction we discussed science fiction, fantasy novel, romance, historical fiction, all varieties of fiction we have already discussed, right. So, in this class uh, we continue our discussion on fiction from a different perspective. So, having discussed uh, fiction and uh, types of fiction, in this class we are going to discuss techniques employed in fiction. In other words, what we are going to share with you today is uh, you know secrets of the trade. When writers write their novel or short story or craft a play, what kind of techniques do they employ when they uh, you know craft a novel or when they write fiction, all right. So, these are called uh, tools of the trade. What are the tools that are required? Uh, if you want to succeed in this trade or if you want to identify the techniques used here. So, you can also call it some kind of secrets, secrets of the trade called fiction, ok. Let us uh, quickly look at uh, some of the important techniques that uh, novelists uh, use. Obviously, well uh, it goes without saying that uh, the list here is not exhaustive, it is just illustrative, it is just to pique your interest in uh, 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 in this concept called narrative technique, ok. So, generally speaking narrative te techniques are those kind of devices that writers use in order to better their structure, you know. In order to enhance the effectiveness of whatever they write, they make use of these narrative structures. It has uh, narrative techniques employed by writers, they have very many advantages to that, but one of the important uh, advantages why writers use many of them, of course, it is to build the storyline or to give it a kind of a turn that they want to give it, give it and also to make uh, their fiction a little more sophisticated, innovative, experimental and entertaining. That is the reason why uh, a writer makes use of narrative techniques, all right. So, what are these narrative techniques that uh, we plan to discuss today, ok. Before introducing you to the first narrative technique that we have in the class, I want you to uh, pause for a while and read the given passage here. This passage is from Mark Twain's uh, A Dog's Tale, please read it, it is an excerpt from there, it is an excerpt from there. Read this and see if you can spot any narrative technique used here. My father was a Saint Bernard, my mother was a Collie, but I am a Presbyterian. This is what my mother told me, I do not know these nice distinctions myself, to me they are only fine large words meaning nothing. My mother had a fondness for such. She liked to say them and see other dogs look surprised and envious. 
as wondering how she got so much education. When I was well grown, at last, I was sold and taken away, and I never saw her again. She was broken hearted, and so was I, and we cried, but she comforted me as well as she could. What kind of a narrative is uh, used here? Obviously, you understand that this entire thing has been written from uh, the perspective of uh, a puppy, probably it is grown now, it is no longer that small puppy uh, that it used to be when all this began. So, it is recounting. So, the character here is not a human being, but uh, you know a dog. So, what is the technique that a writer uses here? This is called anthropomorphism 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 what does it mean well here animals non human beings non human beings whether it's an animal whether it's a thing whether it's a machine whether it's a god whatever it is they are ascribed the qualities of human beings and they are made to behave like human beings they are made to respond like human beings they are made to speak like human beings well, you can uh, find shades of uh, personification here, right? You are not wrong. If you think uh, it has some kind of uh, shades or connections with personification, you cannot altogether be wrong. But remember, the subtle distinction between personification and anthropomorphism is this that uh, in personification, it is more symbolic, you know, it is more symbolic. They do not actually behave like that, you know. You attribute the quality, but they do not behave like that. It is to achieve some kind of an imagery. But here, these animals, these uh, machines, these characters, they are you know attributed the qualities of human being as a result of this. You know, you can look at the picture, you know. Here is a bird that is reading a book. Reading a book is the quality of human beings, right? Whereas here, even when you watch Tom and Jerry, you know, it is again a, a perfect example of uh, anthropomorphism. They start mimicking human beings in a perfect way. So, this technique is called anthropomorphism. So, it is a type of personification, but an extended ver version of personification, while personification is limited to its uh, imagery and uh, figurative language, here it is literal. They talk like human beings, they speak like human beings, behave like human beings. All right. Our Panchatantra tales are filled with these kind of uh, literary devices, techniques used by the writer. So, generally speaking, fables and fairy tales are very well known for making use of anthropomorphic characters. All right. So, it is again a literary technique. When it suits you, probably you too can use it. Okay. So, now that you have learnt uh, one major literary technique that uh, novelists use or fiction writers use, See, here is another one. Of course, Virginia Woolf is, uh, uh, she needs no uh, introduction to you because you are already introduced to her in several of our classes, right. Uh, see, and this is her well known work, it is an excerpt from there. It is a short uh, passage taken from her novel called Mrs. Dolloway. Okay. For having lived in Westminster, how many years now? Over 20? One feels even in the midst of the traffic or waking at night, Clarissa was positive, a particular hush, a solemnity, an indescribable pause, a suspense. Oh, but that might be her heart, right, affected, they said, by influenza, before Big Ben strikes. Oh, there, out it boomed, first a warning, musical, then the hour, irrevocable. Well, if you look at it, what is happening here? There is generally it is said that in a particular paragraph, a paragraph is all about a single idea. But now look here how from words, in fact, it is not even a sentence, you know, I mean, idea is shifting from phrase to phrase, phrase to phrase. This is how our mind works, right? Because our mind does not work in a very linear way. In fact, uh, if there is a path that you can ascribe to the way the mind behaves, human mind behaves, it is absolute jigsaw. It can go in any random fashion, you know, like if you have uh, seen Toro Toro, right? If you have uh, 
may be in any exhibition if you have uh, sat on Toro Toro how it moves in any random fashion something like that. This is how our mind works. So, mimicking this uh, uh, random nature of the mind a writer also puts forth uh, you know various images, various uh, thought processes that run in the mind of a character and how there is no consistency here right. You can note the lack of consistency and how it keeps shifting from one idea to another. This technique that Virginia Woolf uses here is called stream of consciousness. In fact, a remarkable modernist uh, literary technique. It is not that writers before them did not use it, but this uh, literary device or literary technique came to be popularized uh, especially in the 1920s by James Joyce uh, in his uh, uh, seminal book called uh, Ulysses and later most of these modernist writers pick up this strategy and in order to delineate uh, the uh, some kind of you know non-linear incoherent uh, action, incoherent mental action that happens in all of us, they make use of this technique stream of consciousness. So, some of the salient features here include a free association as you can see. Uh, the idea jumps from one to the other and looping repetition is in fact after a couple of sentences you are made to come back to the original sentence then you go away you you know you deviate from there lot of deviations and coming back. And more than that you know there is a very dense uh, sensory observations there is a very dense sensory observations and unrelated non-existent uh, punctuations are also used some kind of strange words. Uh, strange unconventional punctuation and as I said this technique mimics the non-linear way our brains function right. Uh, in fact, uh, commenting on this one of the critics says that in stream of consciousness you find the character characters mind dripping like you know after you take bath, after you take shower, when you come out like water keeps dripping out of your hair. Uh, ideas, uh, thoughts keep dripping out of the character's mind that is the reason why we use it. Of course, uh, it has some kind of connections with the interior monologue that is especially found in uh, plays, but it is subtly different. But for time being we can say that uh, it, it, it talks about uh, the way our uh, brain works, the way the mind jumps from topic to topic and things like that. This is stream of consciousness for us. Okay. Now, from stream of consciousness let us go to the third technique. Okay. Now, please read this and see if you can spot any technique here. It is an excerpt from uh, David Lord's novel called the British Museum in Falling Down. Of course, again you are familiar with David Lord recall uh, he is one of the pioneers of uh, campus fiction. He is one of the major novelists to have popularized campus fiction. Has it ever occurred to you that novelists are using up experience at a dangerous rate? No, I see it has not. Well then consider that before the novel emerged as the dominant literary form, narrative literature dealt only with the extraordinary or the allegorical with kings and queens, giants and dragons, sublime virtue and diabolic evil. There was no risk of confusing that sort of thing. Now, I know what you are going to say. You are going to say that the novelist still has to invent a lot but that is just the point. So, what is the writer doing here? In fact, it looks like a stream of consciousness, but there is a variation here. Of course, the novelist is talking about whatever comes in his mind, the character protagonist, but uh, rather than doing it alone, he is addressing the audience here, you. Now, look at the frequent use of he, you. In fact, you has been scattered all over this short passage. So, this kind of uh, a technique is called breaking the fourth wall this kind of technique is called breaking the fourth wall because uh, following the convention of uh, theater. In fact, theater is supposed to have uh, three walls and the fourth wall is called the audience. Okay? Now, imagine how you know a stage is built in the stage there is one wall, the second wall and there is one wall at the back. Right? Now, there is no fourth wall. If there is the fourth wall, it is the audience that acts as the fourth wall. So, here uh, you break the barrier, you break that barrier and uh, it is called breaking the fourth wall. In the drama they do not generally address you, 
so here in the novel you find the novelist uh, or the protagonist addressing the reader directly right that's why it's called the fourth wall following the convention of a stage we call it and as you said i mean the protagonist here breaks that wall that's the reason why it's called uh, breaking the fourth wall that's a literary technique why does a writer do that of course uh, it's an experimental form in order to involve the audience in order to involve the readers all the more even into the creative process you know it's like uh, turning the reader also into a character right when the reader holds his or her book you know in their hand they also become a part of the character when the novelist or the protagonist addresses them as you and you do this here you do that there so it's a way of involving the audience and it's also to take them into confidence and uh, confide in them rather than a confidant a character here the reader becomes a confidant a character so these are the advantages that's why the writer makes use of this particular technique called the fourth wall or breaking the fourth wall right okay now let's go to another technique and here is a, a, a brilliant uh, passage please read this in this distress the wind still blowing very hard one of our men early in the morning cried out land and we had no sooner run out of the cabin to look out in hopes of seeing whereabouts in the world we were but the ship struck upon sand and in a moment her motion being so stopped the sea broke over her in such a manner that we expected we should have all perished immediately and we were immediately driven into our close quarters to shelter us from the very foam and spray of the sea of course this is by you will have noticed a, a very longish sentence the entire passage is one single sentence here uh, and this is from one of the early english novels we have remember daniel defoe is one of the early practitioners of novel uh, right so robinson crusoe also is one of the early novels we have already discussed that in our earlier classes right in a previous class so this is from there so that's the reason why language is slightly you know not uh, uh, not simple in other words it makes use of lot of uh, longish complex sentence structures but forget the structure of language here now look at the content you know look at how what it is describing so if you can see probably here is uh, you know some people are sailing in the sea and they have been starved of land for many days and the moment somebody spots uh, a patch of land or if they think they have spotted a patch of land how all of them get excited you know so you may think it's nothing unusual here well that's the point he here it's called objective realism in fact objective realism is where uh, you know it's like uh, realist fiction in fact objective realism is a technique that's used in uh, realist fiction that's a type of fiction that we discussed in the previous class you can recall that so in this i mean here the technique is used in order to depict life as it is that's the reason why it focuses on ordinary people real life events and even the so called ordinariness of the extraordinary people that's the reason why it uses it therefore whatever a character watches it here the character goes on explaining it in all the detail all the circumstantial details are presented as vividly and uh, as sensorily uh, i mean enriching way as enriching as possible it's described and generally this technique is connected with the rise of the novel and especially with the rise of capitalism in the 18th century europe of course that's when uh, uh, you can trace the origins of uh, novel to that particular period time period right so uh, some of the important writers who exemplify this technique are you know charles dickens and george eliot in uh, england and you have uh, their european counterparts in tolstoy flaubert and balzac so they exemplify objective realism and of course it's also used widely in uh, early indian novels such as mulkraj's uh, mulkraj anand's untouchable or swami and his friends uh, by r k narayan and others objective realism to explain in as detailed manner in as objective manner as possible uh, 
uh, what you see, what a character sees, objective realism. Okay? Yeah. From objective realism, let us go to learn one more uh, literary technique and here we take an excerpt from Alice Walker's Color Purple. Color Purple. Please read this passage and see if you can uh, spot anything unusual. This becomes evident uh, right from the word go. Man corrupt everything, say shrug, he on your box of grits in your head and all over the radio, he try to make you think he everywhere. Soon as you think he everywhere, you think he God, but he ain't. Whenever you are trying to pray and man plop himself on the other end of it, tell him to get lost, say shrug, conjure up the flowers, wind, water, a big rock. Now, what do you notice here? Obviously, you know, if you did not know our classes well, you would have immediately jumped up or raised your hand and said, this is, this passage is filled with lot of grammatical errors, right. Now, look, man corrupt everything, he show, say shog, he on your box of grits in your head, all these things, all these things, right. It may look like as if, you know, somebody has made lot of uh, grammatical errors. And if you put it in MS Word, probably the entire passage would be in one big red line, right? But that's not true. It's an exact uh, extract. It's an uh, it's an excerpt from the novel Color Purple. So this kind of uh, language, when you use it, the technique is called colloquialism. Colloquialism is basically a, a linguistic technique. You know, uh, in the way you construct your sentences, in the way you use language in the way you employ words and structures. It is called colloquialism, especially many uh, third world countries writers make use of it. In fact, if you can recall some of the poems that uh, you have read of Nizim Ezekiel, you can say it is a colloquialism, right? Indian English poems or even if you read uh, Chinua Achibe, for instance, things fall apart. You may find, uh, you know, colloquialism even Toni Morrison to a certain extent, but not to the extent uh, you find uh, Alice Walker using here. So, it is called colloquialism. What does it do here? The use of language in the novel closely mimics the use of language of the people uh, which it represents. Supposing, you know, it is about uh, African American community, this is how they use the language, you know, this is how they use the language. Therefore, it is more informal and conversational. And in order to bring out an authentic uh, flair and flavor of the character, they mimic uh, the language used in a particular geographical setting, you know, in as realistic uh, fashion as possible. This is called colloquialism. How do you identify this technique? By the use of distinct dialects and linguistic varieties used there. And uh, when you say colloquialism, it is reflected in the proverbs that the characters use, idioms, especially profanities when they curse, when they scold each other. So, it is replete with regional words, curse words, uh, you know. So, that is the reason why it makes use of non mainstream grammar and non mainstream or unconventional syntax and things like that. Okay? So, uh, uh, especially when used in a realist fiction, it becomes uh, very, very powerful because it is capable of evoking uh, a character's setting in as authentic way as possible. You know, you feel as if you are listening to that character in flesh and blood when a, when a writer uses this technique in his or her novels, colloquialism. Yeah, from colloquialism, let us uh, check one more literary device and uh, this particular device, uh, you know, uh, is uh, employed in our uh, one of the early works, the Panchatantra. I am sure all of you have read some stories of the Panchatantra. If not read, you will have heard it from someone or the other. Okay? So, read it. This uh, passage or excerpt is from uh, Panchatantra. Vishnu Sharma said to the three princes, I will now begin the first part of your lessons on how friends may be lost and friendships broken. Listen then to the story of the lion and the bull and their growing friendship that was destroyed by a wicked jackal. Now listen, this is how it happened. Then 
the story of the bull and the lion begins. It has been heard in the city of uh, Mahilropia. There lived a merchant called Vardhaman. It was a, he was an honest and intelligent man and had grown very rich through his keen understanding of business and trade. That is how it grows. Now, what is happening here? Of course, you can see that you know the first paragraph is uh, not connected with the second paragraph here, but they are, I mean of course, they are connected you in a very tenuous link. He says, listen to the story that I have got to say. That itself is a story. What Vishnu Sharma tells the three princes, I mean that itself is a story, but it acts as a frame and within that frame another story unfolds. The story of uh, Sanjeevaka the bull and uh, the lion, you know another lion. So, this kind of a literary technique is called, you know a frame narrative. It is called a frame narrative. So, popularly it is also called a story within a story. If you can recall our Mahabharata exemplifies this particular technique because it said uh, you know the entire Mahabharata is recounted as a kind of a flashback during Janamejaya's Sarpasatra, the snake sacrifice again you are familiar with that story as well. We had discussed it in the context of Arun Kolatkar. Right? So, when Janamejaya is performing uh, the snake sacrifice yagya, that is when of course, uh, uh, the entire Mahabharata has been recounted in a flashback way. So, the story of Sarpasatra acts as a frame within which uh, a major narrative unfolds, the major narrative of the Mahabharata unfolds. That is why it is called a story within a story. You know, most of the times it happens because in order to draw our attention towards what happened earlier, this is used. In fact, it is one of the most preferred uh, literary devices used uh, in folk tales and especially in uh, the Indian uh, cases of the epics and uh, novels, uh, the early novels. Okay. And some of its contemporary practitioners include Joseph Conrad in Heart of Darkness, uh, Emily Bronte in Wuthering Heights and of course, uh, uh, Chaucer too, you know, he, he uses uh, uh, this uh, frame narrative in the Canterbury Tales, a story within a story. So, these are some uh, important uh, uh, literary narratives that we have picked up in this class today. And of course, even in the next class, we are going to discuss uh, literary techniques. Uh, there are some more of course, uh, and before we wind it up, what you can see, uh, this is how it happens. In fact, the entire Panchatantra has been narrated. Uh, uh, it is, you know, I mean, if you know Panchatantra is five tales or five uh, treatises, five books, and uh, each book or uh, each part begins with the frame narrative, and uh, out of that frame narrative, uh, the series of tales emerge from there. So, uh, that is how uh, uh, Panchatantra has been structured in a very beautiful way. Okay. And here is an excerpt from uh, an 18th century illustration of uh, Panchatantra. It is an 18th century manuscript. So, just out of you know uh, curiosity, historical curiosity and for an elegant reason we have used it here. Okay. So, uh, all right. I am sure in this class we have picked up uh, at least uh, 6 to 8 uh, narrative techniques, maybe a little more than that. So, let us continue our discussion of this. I am sure you are finding this uh, activity and this class a uh, very interesting one. Let us pick up this discussion in the next class.